everyone and welcome to our online service this morning it's great that you could join us we're meeting online we're meeting in the church buildings this morning at Dean and at Lostock this afternoon we have our Sunday at 4 service I don't know if uh, people are aware of the Sunday at 4 service but it's for uh, households uh, with uh, primary school aged children so it's it's kind of like an all-age service and uh, there are now 19 households uh, taking part in that service. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge encouragement. So do be praying for that, uh, for that service, which is happening each week. Later in uh, our service online and in the buildings, we'll be uh, looking at the next bit of Paul's letter to the Romans. Um, we're into chapter 2 now. These, uh, these early chapters of Romans, they contain some teaching which is, is really quite challenging. But it is God telling us how it is. It's telling us the truth about the human condition and why the world is as it is. And it's, uh, it's so different, isn't it, what we're hearing in Romans, to what the world tells us. The world often tells us lies and half-truths, but the Bible tells us God's truth. And so it's important that we hear what uh, God is saying to us uh, from his word in the Bible. And so Ben will be preaching uh, on that next bit of Romans later on in the service. We're going to be singing, or you can, you can sing at home, we can't sing in the church buildings yet, but uh, we'll be uh, praising God and encouraging uh, each other in music. Uh, we'll be praying and uh, we'll be worshipping God and hopefully being encouraged as we go through this morning's service. I'm going to read from um, the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, just a few uh, verses from uh, Isaiah chapter 40, and then I'll lead us in prayer before we do anything else. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those whose hope is in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Wonderfully encouraging words there from Isaiah. There are so many things just now in the world, in, in our lives, which are, are, are prone to making us weary. And yet the promise here is that those whose hope is in the Lord will have their strength renewed. They will not grow weary. God will empower us to do what we need to do and to be the people that God calls us to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these wonderful promises. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust your promises in the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. Help us to trust you, Lord. Uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to do what we, we need to do to live for you, to serve you in this world. To be people after your own heart. And keep our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. The one about whom Christianity is, 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 is the focus, is, is why we, we do what we do, is why we meet on Sunday mornings and at other times. It's all about Jesus. Lord, keep our eyes on Jesus. Fill us with your spirit and help us to praise you, Father God. Amen.
can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. What can I do but praise you? Every day you make everything I do. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. When I see the beauty of a sunset's glory, amazing artistry across the evening sky. When I feel the mystery of a distant galaxy, it also humbles me to be loved by a God so high. What can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Of the cross they nailed you to That could not hold you Now you're making all things new By the power of your risen life What can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah, hallelujah.
Today's reading is from Romans 2, verses 1 to 11. God's righteous judgment. <clears throat> you, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and, pa and patience, not realising that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favouritism. This is the word right. of the Lord. Today we're continuing in our series in Romans, we're up to Romans chapter 2. As we come to God's word, let's pray. Father God, please give us humble hearts to receive your word, what you are saying to us today. Help us to put our trust in Jesus and to live our lives for you. In his name we pray. Amen. So in Romans chapter 2, our question is, who actually needs the gospel of Jesus? And to help us think about this question, let me introduce you to two characters, Bella and Fred. Just to say from the outset, I've made up these people, so if they bear any resemblance, to anyone you know, that is purely coincidental. Okay, but Bella is someone who lives in a very nice, neat, orderly house with a neat and orderly garden. And maybe it's on Lady Bridge or somewhere in Lostock. And um, Bella has quite a neat and tidy and orderly life. But over the last year or two, Bella has become more and more concerned with the state of the world and how ugly it is sometimes. Not the natural world, that's still beautiful, but people. Whether it's been in politics over the last few years, or all of the hate that's spewed on the internet, it's left her feeling disgusted. Bella's also seen more and more mess in people's relationships. She's read about celebrities and stories of people cheating on their partners, accusations of abuse. And she thinks, why can't people just be better people? Why can't they leave, live decent lives, you know, like the rest of us? If there is a hell, Bella thinks, well, it's the abusers and the cheats and the warmongers who deserve to go there. I'm not like that. I'm one of the good people. What about Fred? Well, Fred is into sport. Uh, he likes to play a round of golf, he has a decent handicap, he plays in tournaments every now and again and holds his own. Uh, in earlier life he used to hold his own on the football field, he always used to be picked for the starting lineup when he played. And his success in life leads him to think about his relationship with God a bit like how he was in sport. You know, he's lived a decent life, he can hold his own, he's on God's team. God's on his side. God understands him. He's even been to church quite a few times. He's done his bit for God. And he thinks, yeah, God will see me right. I know I haven't been a perfect person all my life, but I've been a decent bloke. I've done all right, and God will let me off the odd little thing I've done wrong. Well, our question today is, do people like Bella and Fred need to be saved by Jesus? And so do they need to hear the good news of Jesus? For that matter, what do they need saving from? 
if they do need saving. Well, our reading from Romans 2 shows us very clearly, yes, they do need saving. Even respectable people, even upright pillars of society need to be saved by Jesus. Why are we on to this subject this week? Well, let me give you a quick recap of Romans so far. In week one, we saw that Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome, and he wants to help them to help him get the good news of Jesus out to the ends of the Roman Empire, to the ends of the world, to Spain, to the barbarians. And then in week two, we saw Paul is writing to people who have a Christian faith in Jesus, but he wants them to see that everyone in the whole world needs to trust in Jesus because everyone needs to be saved by him. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is the power of God to save. And then in week three, this is now two weeks ago, we saw what the gospel of Jesus saves from. It saves from the wrath of God. You might remember our uh, floating ball. Back for a bit of a recap today. Do you remember what God's wrath is directed against? the suppression of the truth against God as we try to cover up and hide the reality of God and the truth of God in life in this world. That is what God's wrath is most clearly directed against, his right anger. And then last week we said that we see this in the world because God's wrath is shown now as God has given people over to their sin and their rebellion against him. Well, today we're in part five into chapter two, as we've said, and Paul tends to think about the people who don't look like they're under God's wrath. It doesn't look like they're experiencing more and more sin and being handed over to it in that way. They look like decent people. They think of themselves as upright members of society, on the side of good, against what's bad and wrong. They might be devoted to their religion, up, uh, committed to upholding the rules and the laws. They might say, yes, Paul, I agree with you. The world is a moral mess, but I'm better than that. I'm on the good side. Well, today we're going to see how God sees such people. We're going to see, actually, no, they too are under God's wrath. So they too need to be saved by Jesus. Therefore, they too need the gospel of Jesus. Firstly, we see this in verses 1 to 5. And I've given this the heading, The self-righteous who still sin have no excuse. Let's look at verse 1. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Well, you don't have to look very far in the world today to see human beings love to pass judgment on others, don't we? Now, whether you read the Daily Mail or The Guardian or something in between or something <laughs> further at either extreme, you will know that there is judgment of right and wrong in our newspapers. Whether it's disapproving tweets on Twitter or disapproving chatter over the garden fence, there is judgment, passing judgment on other people. We like to call out wrong. We have a natural tendency to point the finger and divide ourselves from the bad people. Well, let's think a minute about Bella, who thinks this world is a mess uh, she looks down on the celebrities who cheat on their partners. Well, yes, that is one of the sins that Paul has called out in chapter 1. Sexual impurity, a part of God giving people over to their rebellion. But even in reading the juicy details of that in her glossy magazine, Bella is actually committing another sin in that list in chapter 1, joining in with gossip and slander. Some sins might seem more respectable than others. Some are, e are easier to hide than others. But to God, sin is sin. God sees people's hearts. Remember two weeks ago, we saw the heart of sin. 
God's wrath is centred on the suppression of God's truth? Well, even the most upright and respectable person we could know, if they're living without God, not thanking and honouring God as he deserves, and who of us can say that we've thanked and honoured God like he deserves? Well, if we've not done that, we are guilty of the worst sin of all, however good our life looks on the outside. Now, there is a danger here of getting the wrong end of the stick as to what's being said in this passage as a Christian. This passage is not about making people who do believe in Jesus feel guilty. Paul here is talking about the person who thinks they are good enough for God in themselves and in how they have lived their lives. Verse 5 shows us who Paul is talking to. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So the you Paul is talking to here can't be a Christian. This person Paul is talking to, you, is someone who is unrepentant. But a Christian, by definition, is someone who admits, yes, I am a sinner, I do deserve God's wrath, and I repent, I'm sorry, I'm turning back to God and trusting in Jesus for forgiveness. Now in chapter 2, when Paul talks to the you, he's kind of gone into lawyer mode. He's got the whole of the human race in view and he's putting the human race in the dock and saying, you, oh human beings, you who think you're better than others and who like to judge and put yourself on the good side. But you also sin, don't you? In other ways, perhaps more subtle ways, perhaps more hidden ways, you still sin against God. And so you too deserve God's wrath. It is coming your way you too need to be saved by Jesus. So that's our first point. The self-righteous who still sin have no excuse. They will face God's judgment, as we see secondly in verses 6 to 11, because God's day of wrath is completely fair. Verse 11, we see, for God does not show favoritism. Verse 6, God will repay each person according to what they have done. Well, let's go back uh, to our earlier example of Fred. Now, Fred thinks, I'll be all right with God. I'm a decent bloke. I've lived an all right life. God's on my side. Yeah, I know I've done a few things wrong, but I'm only human. God will let me off. Well, God's word here says, no, there will be no let-offs on the day of judgment. God will not turn a blind eye to anything. There will be a final day of judgment. God has set the date in his calendar. Every human being will face God and have to give an account to him. And here is the standard that God has set in verses 7 to 10. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So yes, if someone could live their life being completely perfect all day, every day of their life, without sin, then they would deserve eternal life. And they would receive it on their own merit. They've earned it. But every kind of wrongdoing, even if we just think it's a little kind of acceptable sin, every kind of wrongdoing will be punished by God. Verse 8 mentions, for example, those who are self-seeking. Well, isn't that people today? People who say, oh, you just need to be true to yourself. You just need to follow your heart. You need to do what's right for you. That is self-seeking. That is actually the opposite of honouring God and living your life for him. 
It's not letting God be in charge of your life, is it? Well, verse 8, for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. God's right judgment. God says that final day of judgment is a real event in the future. And if, even if people don't look like their lives have been given over to more and more sin here and now, they still face God's wrath on that future day. All of us have sinned, of course, I include myself in that. And as we've said, as Christians, we recognise, well, this is us. I too have sinned and am guilty and deserve God's wrath. All of us deserve to be punished in hell. That's why verse 9 speaks of trouble and distress, a conscious punishment. The world today, of course, hates talk, serious talk of hell and wrath. People have done quite a good job in, on the main of, of uh, convincing themselves it doesn't even exist and we've got nothing to fear. Either there is nothing after we die or, or we'll all be all right or only the really bad people will be judged and punished. In fact, these days, if you tell someone in all seriousness, actually all people are sinners and we all, including you, deserve to go to hell, or you can be accused of spiritual abuse, of causing harm to someone because you're making them feel upset. But where is the real harm? Is the real harm in giving someone a loving warning of what's coming their way? so that they can flee to Jesus and take refuge in him and be safe on the day of judgment? Or is the harm really in pretending that God's wrath doesn't exist and just kind of sugarcoating over it and then leaving people to find out for themselves when it's too late? On the day of judgment, it will be too late to say sorry to God and be forgiven by Jesus. God's word leaves us in no doubt God's day of wrath will be completely fair. Since everyone has sinned, everyone deserves God's wrath. Everyone, therefore, needs to be saved by Jesus. This is a loving warning. Let me say again, if you're hearing this warning today and you have admitted your sin and you know you deserve God's wrath and you've turned to Jesus and repented, then you have absolutely nothing to fear on the day of judgment because Jesus has covered it all for you as we're going to see in a couple of weeks' time. There may be others listening today and you've always thought you'll be all right with God because you've lived a good life. You don't think you really deserve God's wrath on balance? Maybe you think that's for people who are worse than you. Well, I warn you today, you do deserve God's wrath. You are facing it on the day of judgment. And you must turn to Jesus, repent of your sin, to be saved. Well, that is what everyone in the whole world needs saving from. So all of us, let's not be fooled into thinking that our really nice, orderly, respectable neighbour doesn't need Jesus, doesn't need to be saved. Let's not be fooled into thinking that the upstanding, devoted member of a local religious group who we see around or who lives near us or who we're friends with doesn't need Jesus. Oh, they're all right, they're following their path. No. Everyone is accountable to God for how they have lived their life. And the only way to be saved from this wrath is through trusting Jesus. All sin, however big or small it looks, will be punished. And so we all need the gospel. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for revealing to us the reality of the situation we face. All of us have sinned. All of us deserve your wrath. We admit our sin and our guilt and we thank you for Jesus and we turn to him and ask you to save us, forgive us through him. And as we trust in Jesus, please give us assurance 
that we will be safe on the day of judgment in him. And please give us confidence that everybody around us needs this good news message. Help us to be involved in supporting the cause of bringing this news to others. In Jesus' name, Amen. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Most merciful Father, our Creator and Judge, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We earnestly repent and are truly sorry for all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us and strengthen us to serve and obey you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. In our prayers this morning, there will be brief silences for your own reflections and prayers. When I conclude a section with these words, You are the Lord, our Creator, our Redeemer, our hope and our Judge. Please respond. Hear our prayers, for we ask in Jesus' name. Our God is an awesome God. Let us humbly approach his throne of grace. O Lord our God, who was and is and is to come, sovereign in power and authority, all-seeing, all-knowing, perfect in justice and love, as we bow before your throne in worship and thanksgiving, mercifully extend to us your sceptre of grace and hear our prayers. O Lord Most Holy, we bring our grateful thanks for the salvation made possible through the death and resurrection of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ for the inspiration and empowerment you give us by the gift of your Holy Spirit, for the faithful witness of the Apostles who first spread abroad the Gospel of Christ, and for the freedom today to read and learn from your Holy Word. You are the Lord, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Hope and our Judge. Hear our prayers, for we ask in Jesus' name. We pray for your church. May the promise of resurrection and eternal life through Jesus and the promise of his paradise focus our hearts on your eternity and truth. Help us to persevere in obedience and faithfulness to your teachings, that we may live fruitfully for your kingdom here on earth and at the end join in the life of the new creation with the saints who have gone before. Where there is willfulness, self-centeredness, false beliefs and wrong deeds within your church, May the sword of your spirit disarm all that is contrary to the perfect goodness that flows from your living word. Give wisdom and guidance, protection and provision for all godly leaders to stand firm in faith that they may teach and live the way of truth. You are the Lord, our Creator, our Redeemer, our hope and our judge. Hear our prayers, for we ask in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy, as people ask questions about life and death, in the face of the coronavirus, may your Holy Spirit guide them to the hope that only the risen Jesus can give. Comfort and provide for those who are left in grief, disability, financial disaster and homelessness. We pray for international cooperation 
for a fair distribution of the present vaccines and the speedy development of new vaccines to combat any further mutations of the virus. We pray for the health and well-being of all medical staff and those who care for the sick, the weak and the vulnerable in our society. Bring your light to their eyes and joy to their hearts. We pray for deliverance for peoples oppressed and controlled by dictatorships and tyrannical regimes, whether by physical force or ideological control. May the power of your truth bring freedom and hope. You are the Lord, our Creator, our Redeemer, our hope and our Judge. Hear our prayers, for we ask in Jesus' name. Our Lord and Father, we pray for ourselves and our communities. May your Holy Spirit and the power of your word strengthen the light of Christ Jesus within each one of us that we might shine forth the gospel of Christ to our families, friends and neighbours. Inspire us to be and to do such that the whole community will be drawn to Jesus. Give the leadership of the church wisdom in decision-making for the practical matters and the spiritual direction of the church. We pray for growth in spiritual understanding and development of moral character in our children and young people as they take part in the Sunday at four sessions and the Sunday youth groups. We pray for understanding and enlightenment for members of the New Christianity Explored group and all the Bible study groups. May those who are new leaders grow in knowledge and confidence. We give thanks for our new trainee minister, Josh, praying we may mutually help and encourage each other as we journey deeper into the knowledge of Christ. You are the Lord our Creator, our Redeemer, our hope and our Judge. Hear our prayers, for we ask in Jesus' name. Now let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Today we're praying for Kosovo in Eastern Europe, a UN protectorate which declared independence from Serbia in 2008, but remains unrecognised by Serbia. Kosovo has a population of 2.1 million and an estimated 200,000 Christians. It's one of Europe's weakest economies and growth is difficult among sanctions, poor policies, corruption, damage from conflict and organised crime. You can use the following prayer points to inform your own prayers or simply pray along with me now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for Kosovo. Lord, you see the distress of this country whose future seems gloomy and uncertain. Resolution of ancient hatreds between Serbs and ethnic Albanians seems far off. But we pray in your mighty name for a spirit of forgiveness and lasting peace to transform the country. Father, we also pray for a stable economy, increased employment and an end to exploitation of Kosovars for personal gain. We praise you that although most Kosovars are Muslim, some follow Christ. Please bring many more to know Jesus to whom they are precious. And Lord, we pray for an end to the religious hatred that has destroyed churches in the country. We thank you too for ministries and missionaries working in Kosovo and praise you for the fruit they bear, particularly among the youth and children. Father, we pray that expats would continue to have freedom to work in Kosovo and for more male Christian workers for this harvest field. Finally, we praise you so much that the number of evangelicals has grown from 80 in 1998 to 2000 today with 35 churches. Please enable their witness and bless the evangelical movement of Kosovo for your eternal glory. In Jesus' glorious name, Amen.
close with uh, a prayer from the, uh, the end of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen.